So it's only if you if you do the math from 19 what 67 when the declaration was first revealed to 72 how many years is that what 5 years yeah it's not it's not long it's not long right so there's there's something there there's yeah. there's, some, there's some kind of transmission that's going on immediately after this declaration is revealed supposedly well, when when did um like people like Tlacaelel uh, and uh, Florencio Yescas and uh, Andres Segura when did they really start coming up? Because well, that's yeah, that's a complicated story. I mean, based on my research, Florencio Yescas really his first um, um, his first entradas, for lack of a better term, into the into the U.S. was, I mean, you can date it back to the 50s. Really? I mean, yeah, I have found, and, and others have documented this, and I think he also expressed it uh, to some of his students, Mario Aguilar, who's written a dissertation about his experience in danza, being one of the first danzantes that danced with Flo. I think uh -huh. he also mentions that, that Yescas told him about his initial forays into the u.s going back to the 50s but he wasn't like doing danza like the way we know it he was coming up making money you know dancing in different like uh, dance troops and yeah yeah and, like, like can can and shows and can -can, stuff yeah right? that sort of stuff right cabaret because he was doing it for the money right he was here to yeah. make some money and he was a classically classically trained dancer right exactly and so when he really starts coming up to teach danza tradicional is uh, probably in the early 70s, like 70, 71, 72, mm -hmm. right around the time so, that this movie came out. Yeah, so there was definitely a, um, like a conduit, or there, right. there was definitely a, a way that this this information was able to be transmitted, you know, prior to the internet, prior to, you know, emails, there, there were people coming back and forth at this time that could oh, have been yeah. putting this and information out. In fact, there there was an organization called the White Roots of Peace. Um, I briefly uh, talk about it in my dissertation. I don't really do too much with it because it would have taken me into a whole different direction. But the White Roots of Peace, if I'm not mistaken, that was an organization that was started by uh, members of the um, the Iroquois tribe and how they were trying to sort of, I'm not mistaken, that was an organization that was started by uh, members of the um the Iroquois tribe and how they were trying to sort of uh, spread the message of, of uh, um, going back to their, their prophetic, uh, I forget what they call him, like a, not, not like a God, but like a, like a sort of a, a prophet. They got mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's what they call him. And, and so they were trying to spread that message uh, of of you know coming back to the traditions right it's sort of like a return to tradition uh, a way to sort of rehabilitate a lot of the urban indians who had lost their way after they had been removed from reservations and forced onto the urban centers and how there was that disconnect between the the younger generations who were you know starting to be born in the 60s and 70s and so this organization goes back to if i'm not mistaken they started sometime in the late 50s and and throughout the 60s, what they would do is they would go to Mexico or they would uh, contact indigenous people in Mexico. And I think they made contact with uh, Danzantes. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to, it was like the beginnings of the pan-indigenous movement, mm -hmm. sort of, right? And say so that they would bring Danzantes. And in fact, and, uh, Andres Segura, you know, the the other gentleman that, that introduced Danza to the U.S., his first... Uh, uh, entries into the U.S. date to the late '60s, and he started the first Shinashtli yeah. uh, uh, dancer group in San Antonio in, I believe, '67 or '68, and he came up with the White Roots of Peace. Huh. Yeah, right, and so that. and so they would go around the country doing shows at universities, at local uh, rec centers, at churches, whoever would have them, like local com community spaces, because they were trying to reach the, the urban indigenous population. Mm -hmm. And they were beginning to also sort of incorporate, you know, because of the Chicano movement, you know, they were beginning to make uh, these connections with Chicanos who were interested in indigeneity. And so I think that somewhere along the lines, this message of the declaration of Guatemoc and this uh, idea of a prophecy of the return to Aslan sort of begins to take hold 
and and you get a merging of traditions between Mexico and and what the Chicano movement was trying to promote. Mm-hmm. And so this prophecy sort of emerges from that. And I think it's connected to the consigna. I mean, I have no proof at this point because I don't have any actual sources, but just thinking about these things makes me wonder if there's some connection right there. Well, it was all going on at the same time, right? And it was a lot of the same people that were associated with uh, the consigna and, and the the birth of danza. So I think you're on to something there, Dr. Ariano. I, I think uh, I think that's worth looking into further and investigating. Absolutely. But the thing with the the declaration that you know when I when I uh, when I dropped out of high school and um, saved up money and then I went to Mexico, right? And when I was there, I was basically like full on Mexicayo. And I remember if you go to the Zócalo, right by the Templo Mayor Museum, there's this this art piece on the wall that has the declaration of Cuauhtémoc on it. I've seen it on Google Streets or whatever that's called. Yeah, yeah, you could look it up. You can look it up. And uh, to me, so I, I thought that that gave it like this uh, air of validity, right? Like this made it, it, it legitimized it in my eyes. Because right, because it's being sanctioned by the state somehow, right? It's, exactly. it's up on a wall. It's up on a wall. It's right by the Templo Mayor Museum. It's in between the Templo Mayor Museum and um, the, the cathedral right there in the Socalo. So you could go right. look at it and read it. And that, I was like, oh, well, it must be real. Right. I mean, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't put it on a wall if it right. wasn't real. And when I got back to the United States, I, I really I dug through history books and I dug through all these different books on Mexico. I couldn't find it anywhere. Hmm. And, you know, I was I was a pretty hardcore believer at the time. So I think I just kind of made an excuse of, oh, well, maybe they just didn't know about it or, right. you know, but. They're, they're trying to keep it a secret, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it wasn't until later when we started talking, we really started questioning these things around the same time. And, uh, like, man, I bet you the declaration's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, th- the first time that I was exposed to it um, was probably, and I think we talked about this briefly before, uh, uh, in Lowrider magazine, um, mm. they used to have uh, a column by Roberto Rodriguez. It was like the Raza Report or something. Mm-hmm. Something like that, who now goes by the name of Dr. Simply, I believe. And I, I want to say that, I don't know if it was it was uh, one of his pieces or someone else that was under the same kind of column. But I do remember like reading that or an idea of it, or the consigna de Cuauhtémoc, or, or hearing it mentioned. But I don't think I was really ever exposed to the entirety of what, you know, the consigna says, the, the entire, um, you know, declaration itself until I met you and I met uh, our good friend uh, Evelio Flores in the Danza mm-hmm. here in, in Dallas. And, and, and I think it, you were one of the first people that, that, that I remember that was handing out uh, a lot of literature on Mexicayo yeah. and... Yeah. And one of those uh, pamphlets that you gave me had the, the entire speech on, on it, right? And, and it was very impressive, right? But, you know, it's like you said, you know, after a while, you begin to dig a little deeper. And, you know, people like me and you, like, we're like, okay, what is the source of this? If, yeah. if it's true that Guatemoc is the author and that it, if it's true that as the story goes that he, he pronounced this declaration the night before... He surrendered and Tenochtitlan fell to the Spanish, which would have been on the night of August, what, the 12th? Right? Yeah, the night of the 12th and the then 12th, the 13th is, and the, is when it fell. When it fell. And so, and then, you know, if you, when you ask, well, how come, like you were saying, how come this isn't in the history books? How come we've never really heard this in the official story of, you know, the fall of Tenochtitlan, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we would ask people, like in our danza circles, respectively, and like the common answer, and I'm sure people listening to this that have heard this before will will uh, 
you know, this will sound familiar to you. When, you know, you get the the same refrain. It's like, oh, well, it was hidden, you yeah. know, by elders, um, and you know, it was it was uh, foretold that one day it would be revealed at the proper time to the right people. Yada mm-hmm. yada yada. There's always this secret, right? There's always yeah. this mystery. There's always the sort of uh, um, sort of secretive group of elders that has like the the knowledge that they're they're holding. You yeah, know. and it's a common trope within yeah. like, new age movements too. Exactly, they, exactly. You know, we, we we got this information from a secret council of elders, and then you are actively discouraged from investigating it further right. or questioning it. Or, you know, and, and the way they did this in the Mexicayo uh, was, you know, you're explicitly told. When I was in Mexico, I was explicitly told, you cannot trust anthropologists. You cannot mm-hmm. trust archaeologists. Exactly. You cannot right. trust historians. Well, then who can I trust? You can right. trust us. Uh-huh. And we have a secret knowledge. And it's it's very culty, you know. It is. It's it like, is. Uh, well, wait a minute. How come I can't question these, these right. teachings? Like they tell you specifically to your face. And when I lived there, when I, when I came back and it's the reason I had all this literature to hand out is I was specifically given the task. Like they told me, Gurli, you know, when you get back, it's your job to spread Mexicayo. You know you what I like back, to call it? Cause I did the same thing after you left, you, you, you left me with a lot of, um, um, uh, original copies of mm-hmm. material and, and what i would do is i would make like booklets like i would staple stuff together and just mm-hmm. hand it out wherever i went yeah. i like to call that phase of of, of my michigan uh, um identity and and life uh the uh, born again michigan oh yeah yeah because you know, that's, that's basically what it is you're a born like a born again whatever christian or what have you like you are adamant and passionate about what you you're doing and you want to spread the gospel to the world and you want to be the most hardcore right and and you get upset because people don't listen and they're not accepting (laughs) the truth that you have to share with them it's very i mean going back to what you're saying it's very culty very culty. it it really is and that's how i kind of you know i'm not comparing myself to malcolm x but i could kind of understand how malcolm x felt when he left the nation of islam when he realized like Man, these guys don't know what the hell they're talking about. Like, <laughs> this is a bunch of bullshit. This isn't Islam. <laughs> no, that's why it's the nation of Islam. You yeah. Get it right, man. Yeah, exactly. No, but what I was going to, I wanted to go back to this idea. Let's, let's, for the sake of argument, let's say that it's true that this declaration was spoken by Cuauhtémoc uh, the night before the fall of Tenochtitlan. And let's say, let's continue this argument and let's say that it's true that uh, I guess he must have only spoken it to a select few that could hear him because otherwise the word would have spread far and wide. And so let's say that there was a select group of chosen people, for a lack of a better term, right, that were supposed to guard this declaration and then pass it down over the generations, right? You would think that at some point someone would have said, wait, well, maybe now is the time to share this in 500 years. Right. Right. Like uh, it doesn't take that long before someone has that urge and that itch to say, yeah. Hey, wait, I know this thing. There's the secret yeah. that, that I have. And, you know, it, it well, was, it was told to me by my, by my grandfather. And especially and I think considering he, he told com- it to me for a reason, because I think maybe I'm the one that needs to reveal it now. Yeah. Well, especially considering <laughs> the, the absolute hell that, the entire, you know, indigenous people of Mexico were going through following the the conquest. Right. At some point in time. That would have been very would, inspirational. Yeah, exactly. You would have wanted to have been like, hey, guys, it's going to be okay. Right. And and here's why. Because Tata Cuauhtémoc said this. Yeah, he's, he, he left us a, a roadmap on how to, how to handle this, what's happening yeah. to us right now. And nobody did that. So and no one. And what? 1967. What's so special about that year? What was going on? Well, seriously, I mean, uh, because because the 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 massacre at Tlatelolco happens the following year, right? 
And then and also and then the Reginos start. <laughs> well, but also coincidentally, Nieva Lopez dies shortly after the massacre, or was it before? But he died that same year. And because of all the political ter- turmoil, his sister Iscalotzi and uh, other people who, who were part of the MCRCA, who were his like you know uh, fervent followers, yeah, they believe that the government had um, assassinated him because uh, I don't know if you if you recall this, but he was running for president under the MCRCA. Yeah, the MCRCA was a political party. A political they were, they party. Were operating as a political party. And so for a long time, a lot of his followers going up into the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, Lina Odena Güemes did her um, analysis of the MCRCA and Nieva Lopez, when she was interviewing people, a lot of them like revealed to her that they still held true to the belief that the government had assassinated Nieva Lopez for his political beliefs and because they think in their perception that he was gaining ground and could have possibly won the presidency. Right. So that so that's a year after the, the declaration is, is revealed. And then in 1970, what, what happens in 1970? Uh, there was, there was, I'm missing the date here because it's 67, 68, or 69, 69. What happens in 69? You have uh, the, um, the the conference in Denver, right? Mm-hmm. With Alurista and Corky and um, El Plan Espiritual de Aztlán. And, and so, you know, you have to wonder, like, what is the connection running here with all of these things? Because shortly after that, you get a like a, a, a burst of indigenous energy that begins to take hold throughout Aztlan. This year, August 13th, 2021, is the 500th year anniversary of the fall of Mexico Tenochtitlan. That's right. And I suspect we're going to be hearing a lot of this declaration being read at uh, Mexica events or, you know, online at least people are going to be reposting this all over the place audio recordings because it is very inspirational and it's very impressive when you hear it but i really encourage our listeners to cast a critical eye on it the um, they first reveal um the mcrca and they reveal the uh, consigna uh, through their newsletter uh, iscalo in 19 19- 67 67 right and then it's also published in 1969 in the book Mexicayo mm-hmm. which is a year after Nieva has passed already mm-hmm. and they took the name Mexicayo from the source that was written in the, in the 16th century by Tesosomoc who calls his uh, Mexicayo Mm-hmm. And the passage that you uh, very adeptly were able to correlate with what sounded like the consigna comes straight from the Mexicayo. Yeah. So, right, I think, I don't know if you do it, if you did it here or if you've done it recently, but I remember in, um, some years past you, that you were making the comparison how you thought that perhaps the consigna was modeled directly from those words that you suggest should be, should be replaced uh, with the consigna, right? Isn't that, is, am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah. But also going back to this idea of uh, the celebration, the 500 celebration this year, I mean, considering who the president of Mexico is now, do you think that maybe AMLO might come out? Man, and, he might, right? He right, might I mean. Have a televised event where he gets up and he reads, he, he might even dress up like Guacamole and get up there. And, right, or he might even get an, a native Nahuatl speaker to do it in Nahuatl. Yeah, right. Get up there and just with all the pageantry and, and you know television and a big budget, and uh, once again glorify in, in Mexico's indigenous past, but completely ignore Mexico's indigenous present. Yeah, which seems to be the uh, the mo of the Mexican government, right? If you go back to the origins of Mexican nationalism. I mean, it, it starts with the Criollos, and, yeah. and it, it starts really with the Criollos who are the the sons, well, I would say sons, and maybe not so much the daughters, because it was a very patriarchal society, more so back then than perhaps it still is in, today in Mexico, right? But those Criollo sons of the great conquistadors, you know, um, 
they they were beginning to assume that Mexican identity, mm-hmm. saying we are from here and we are the inheritors of the next great civilization, as many civilizations that have come and gone on, on this great land of Anahuac, right? This is before Mexico is Mexico today, mm-hmm. right? They're already talking about how they're the next inheritors of of the great civilization you had you had the i don't think the olmec were um known back then but they knew of the, the tolteca they knew of teotihuacan they knew uh, of the maya uh, and they knew obviously of the azteca and so they were trying to compare themselves the criollos were saying we're the next in that great mm-hmm. line of great yeah. civilizations this unbroken chain unbroken of, chain of great civilizations right. And so that's where it comes from. And so this idea of looking to the past to legitimize yourself and power in the present is, you know, a Mexican tradition that goes back to to the colonial period. You know? Yeah, and it's rooted in, like we were saying, pseudo history, right? They're rewriting exactly. history. They're misrepresenting history. They're distorting what distorting actually happened. It, misrepresenting, exactly. In order to advance a very specific political nationalist agenda and right. the thing that you know so i get a lot of people in the mexicayo who you know obviously they get very angry when i tell them you know that a lot of the stuff that we were led to believe is actually false they they react very emotionally and one thing that i don't think they're ready to reconcile is the fact that the mcrca was extremely xenophobic was ultra nationalistic uh, was basically racist. You know, they were also they, kind of Nazi sympathizers. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, how do you reconcile that? Just because it makes you feel good? The the way that they reconcile it is by the fact that they're oblivious as to who the MCRCA really were, if they even know who they were to begin with. A lot of them, a lot of people on the so-called Mexicayo and Red Road or what have you, have never heard of the MCRC, have never heard of Neva Lopez. Yeah, right. That's true. And so they take the consigna, and then after you tell them where it comes from, who, you know, it, it didn't just get revealed by this, you know, council of elders through the organic tradition of danza or whatever you want to call it. It was actually a political organization that revealed there's a source. We have found the source, right? They've been telling us who they are. Yeah. And we they've know never, their agenda. We know they've what never they were been shy to about what they were up to. Right. Yeah. Just because you didn't know about it doesn't mean that it, it, it didn't exist or it didn't happen. I mean, we can only lead people to the facts and it's up to you to decide if you want to accept them. But, you know, the facts are what they are. You, you can't you can't argue the facts. You yeah. Can choose to ignore them. You can choose to dismiss them. But it doesn't mean that those facts don't exist. Yeah, that's the great thing, you know. It's it's true whether or not you want to believe it. <laughs> exactly. And with that, dear listeners, we will bid you farewell. Thank you for listening to another episode of Tales from Aztlantis. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa. And Tlacateca. Until next time, remember, the truth doesn't always taste good. But it comes from elders. <laughs> Moitasse. <laughs> <laughs>